G'day guys and welcome to Medieval Mayhem on this channel. You'll find lots of videos into the whole medieval period. You'll find reviews into other people's gear. You'll find crafting videos into making your own costumes. You'll find DIY videos into making your own furniture. You'll find how-to videos into all sorts of medieval camping and that kind of thing. We do videos for, we analyze historical events, what happened, who were the key players, and why did things turn out the way that they did. So if medieval is your thing, this is the channel for you, and you might want to consider subscribing. In this video, we're going to make a kite shield for modern medieval reenactment. Before we get started, we're going to need a few fairly basic things. We're going to need a shield blank. Now, I bought mine from a company called Medieval Fight Club. I'll leave a link in the description below. You're going to need uh, some fabric. I just use a coarse linen. You can also use cottons or canvases, whatever works for you. You're going to need um, some PVA glue. This one is um, suitable for interior and exterior use. This is called Sikaflex. It's absolutely fantastic and I highly recommend it. You're going to need some oil-based enamel paint. This is really important. Uh, Water-based paint obviously will degrade when it gets wet, so uh, not always that great for, for reenactment use. Uh, a pencil or some kind of marking device. Uh, you're going to need some leather straps. Uh, I would strongly suggest vegetable tanned leather. Probably uh, a minimum for me would be two or two and a half millimeters thick. I usually use at least two and a half mil sometimes three mil, which is around about seven or eight ounce leather for those of you who are in America. You're gonna need some carriage bolts as well to hold the uh, straps in place. And I also use what's called a shield boss. Shield boss is not necessary for kite shields, depends on the period. Um, kite shields first came in around about the sort of 960s, 970s. They first seem to have appeared uh, in Western Europe and they became very common throughout various Frankish armies, the Norman armies, the uh, Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings. So uh, definitely um, very much the shield of, of a lot of different cultures. Very much a Byzantine influence as well for those of you who, are, who know your shields. And uh, we'll, we'll talk more about this in a, in a video coming up next week. I strongly recommend using rawhide around the edges. Some people use leather. I, I, I much prefer rawhide. Um, and with that, I use a blunt needle and some just natural fiber twine pebbles. All right, uh, I think that's pretty much most of what you'll need. We'll go through it more in detail as we get into it. All right, let's go. Okay, so we're taking our shield blank and the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna apply a liberal covering of white glue. The glue that I personally use for all of my projects like this is Sikaflex. Uh, Alright, you should be able to see that. This is a really, really good glue. I've never had it fail and it works really well for indoor and outdoor applications. Perfect for me. Alrighty. So we want uh, three coverings. I'm using a coarse linen. Ignore the fact that it's yellow. We're going to paint it anyway. Uh, so let's get on. Just make sure you brush off any grass or dirt or um, uh, sawdust, that kind of stuff. As I said, liberal covering. I just use my fingers. You can. It's it's a white glue. It's basically water-based, so I'm not worried at all about just washing it under the taps. Oops. I realize I'm using a plywood shield blank here. This isn't obviously historically accurate. This is obviously uh, designed for the modern reenactors of today. And for those of you who are, are newer to the whole process, all right, you want to try and get right up into the edges. As I said, we're going to do three applications here. Two on the front and one on the rear. 
It's very important and it adds a lot of life to your shield. This should last a few years worth of decent combat. Once you've got that on, you then want to keep the fabric pretty taut. Nice and tight, not overly tight, but pretty tight. All right. Bear in mind any uh, any kind of uh, misdemeanors at this level will come through to the top. So anywhere you've got air bubbles, anywhere you've got stretch marks, anywhere you've got sawdust, dirt, sticks, grass, whatever underneath, not a good thing. Okay. Now a lot of people and typically will allow that to dry for 24 hours before putting on the next layer. Um, I don't think you have to. So we're going to go ahead and apply the next layer now. Let's see how this goes. That glue is fairly expensive. But I use it a lot. I go through one of those tubs like every month. What this does is uh, it, it really does increase the durability of the wood that's underneath. Back in medieval times, they actually would have done something very similar to this. They would have used, again, a coarse linen and used a cheese glue to, uh, to make their shields with. What I then do is use bulldog clips or at least we call them bulldog clips here in Australia. Keep your fabric really taut, really tight. You don't want any stretch marks at all. And I place these about every 20 centimeters, trying to apply a nice even layer of pressure. Alrighty, there we go. So that is the, uh, the first kind of stage of the kite shield. I'm going to leave that to dry for a couple of hours and then I'll be applying the same kind of technique to the back of the shield. That's really important because it means there's an even amount of pressure on the shield. Alright, we uh, allowed the glue to dry overnight and it seems to have come up remarkably well actually. Um, there's still a few little splotches of glue which haven't quite cured. Not surprising, it was pretty chilly last night. But otherwise it's come up really well. Now I'm just going to flip it over and put the, uh, the fabric on the, the inside of the shield. Just going to trim away the excess fabric which I don't need. Copious amounts of white glue. Because of the curvature of the shield, you're not going to get the same kind of tautness as uh, you would have done on the other side. That's fine. I don't need to. This is really as much as anything about this is really as much as anything about the tension on the on the actual wood itself is the same on both sides of the shield. It also adds considerably to the strength of the shield and uh, once this is cured we'll add the shield boss and do the painting. Righto, so we now have our fabric all nice and glued on both sides. It's come out really really well. Now what I'm going to do is I start attaching the shield boss. A shield boss is not necessary for a kite shield. Some had, some didn't.
iconography and we can see it in uh, effigies, we can see it in descriptions. So it's up to you whether you decide to use a shield bus on your kite shield. Uh, I personally do like using them. I think it gives the shield quite a lot of value. Um, but it wasn't, I don't believe it had become a functional item as much as it was in the round shields. Right, you can now see the, the shield boss mounted on and that's pretty good. Now what I'm going to do is paint the shield. Alrighty, let's um, add a little bit of colour to the um, to the kite shield. The yellow's come up really well. I just want to add a bit of detail in there. Uh, when it comes to rawhide around the edges of a shield, that's very historically accurate. And the reason they did that is it stopped the weapons like axes and swords from splintering the shield. The cheapest and most effective way i found of getting hold of bulk rawhide is to get hold of one of uh, these dog chews. Now, I've had this soaking for a couple of hours. They come apart very easily. There we go. And all you do is you, I don't need any of that, that can go to my dog. I'm really just interested in the longer pieces. They cost a couple of dollars from, you know, uh, in, in Australia we have the reject shop, two dollar shops, pet stores, a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, all sells the same kind of thing and um, they don't cost too much money. Alrighty, we're now just putting on the uh, the rawhide strap. So as I said earlier, all I do is just use a, a dog bone thing, dog treat. And I fold the, the rawhide in half and apply that to the edge. I do know some people use like, like hot glue, um, a sinsel type natural fibre rope onto the um, but I don't believe that's necessary. I have done it in the past, but... Um, I prefer to hand stitch my shields. I make a lot of shields. Um, and I find hand stitching just gives them so much of a nicer finish. There's a lot of uh, debate about whether shields were nailed around the edges or not. Um, and you see that a lot in what they call popular culture. I don't believe it's very historically accurate. Nails cost a lot to produce. They took about 15 or so minutes of a blacksmith's time. So um, that's genuinely quite an expensive investment um, for one nail. So a lot of nails would have been required to build a shield. I just don't see it. And, and for those of you who don't know what a back stitch is, it, it's basically just a running stitch. Two forwards, one backwards basically. And so you end up with a, a nice continuous line. And really what it's doing is just holding the rawhide in place as it dries. The rawhide will become really quite strong once it has dried and doesn't really need a lot to hold it in place. 
Um, interestingly, I'm finding mine drying quite quickly today. Um, I use just a very simple natural fibre string, I suppose, that you can get from pretty much any hardware store or convenience store, craft shop. I use a blunt needle because I don't want to cause any more damage to the rawhide. Um, and the more holes you put in, you do uh, essentially weaken the rawhide if you're not careful. I space mine approximately an inch and a half or 40 millimeters separately. I, I just eyeball it as you've just seen. I don't see the need to get too carried away. You want to pull the stitches pretty tight because the rawhide has swollen whilst it soaks in water. And, um, and therefore as it dries it's going to mean that the string will um, become looser because there's not as much rawhide there to hold. When you come to the end of a section I, I just usually just tie it off um, and if I haven't got very much string left which is the case here then I'll just cut that and start again. Kite shield is basically now complete. We've got three layers of uh, fabric onto the shield blank. We've got the shield boss on. We've got it painted and now we're around. just going to wait for that to cure. And then we'll do the, the, uh, the straps tomorrow. We're just doing the strap placement at the moment. Um, if you look at the Bayou Tapestry, uh, the strap placement actually varies on almost every single kite shield which I find very interesting and it indicates to me that the shields were actually um, built around the individual fighting style of particular individual soldiers or knights or, or warriors as they might have been. Um, so I'm just going to put the arm straps on for now. In a couple of days I'm going to put on the, the gear strap. But I just need to um, make a few decisions about exactly how that's going to work. Alrighty, so um, these straps are officially termed as N-arms. I need to, uh, as I say, just work out where the gear strap is going to go because that did vary slightly from shield to shield uh, through the period and we can see that on um, some of the relics that have been found. However, this for right now is going to work really well. Some people have a pad here that's actually not consistent with the early medieval period. Um, that's much more of a later medieval period thing. That's fine though, uh, if you want to use it, a lot of reenactors do. But uh, really just for me, I just need to, to work on the gear strap and then that's really, that's really done. I'm going to do another video um, about the kite shield which will come out in a few days time. But uh, for right now, this is all this is all finished. Alrighty, guys, all finished, all done. I'm really, really, really happy with this. This has come out really, really well. For reenactment purposes, this is fantastic. Yes, this is a plywood shield. I realise that, and there's quite a few people who are going to leave some interesting comments about that. I get it, and I'm not uh, I'm not overly surprised, and I'm okay with it. Um, for reenactment use, this is fine. It is a heavier shield and probably would be historically accurate. Okay, I've got no issue with that. Uh, for training purposes, that's fine. Um, you want to have a heavier shield anyway. Uh, I'm going to do another video about the kite shield in, in probably a few days or a week's time. Just depends on how I go for scheduling. But, uh, but I'm really looking forward to that, to really having a look at about the kite shield and some of the historical accuracies and inaccuracies of the kite shield. When did it first come in and who was using it? Because there is a lot of very interesting detail there. So for those of you who are into medieval reenactment or uh, are into a little bit of cosplay, LARP, that kind of thing, 
you know, this is a really good project. It's not that expensive. Uh, these sort of shields should last you at least sort of, you know, eight to 10 to 12 years worth of, worth of use. Um, I fight regularly, so um, I'm sort of looking at around about the five to eight year period for this, but that's okay. Um, and I'm making a lot of shields at the moment because Medieval Mayhem is actually going to be involved in a uh, historical reproduction of a, uh, an 11th century event. So that'll be interesting. That'll be coming out uh, hopefully in 2021. We'll see how things go. Alrighty, um, I'm really, really happy with this. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.